very often to create content to maybe write a book or create art or music, whatever it is, is done mostly alone. And then once ready to be birthed into the world, that's where the opportunities to connect with others lives. So the only way I know how to keep going forward when I'm not sure anyone's listening is to answer the question, why? Why does it matter? Does it even matter? Hello, and welcome to the Emotional Expedition Podcast. I'm Meg Thomas, and if you want to live a more open-hearted, magical life, it all starts with your emotions. This podcast will take you on a journey, helping you to better understand, express, release, and heal your emotions. Let's get exploring. I've been thinking a lot about our emotions the language of our emotions, and this podcast. And the question I've been asking myself is, does it even matter? I've been doing this podcast now for five months and 26 episodes, and very often it feels like I'm in a bubble all by myself. In some ways, being an entrepreneur for most of my life, I'm already familiar with this feeling. As a wedding photographer, I would typically actually only meet with the clients maybe three times, the day of their consultation, their engagement session, and then again on their wedding day. And then I'd work with them for an entire year. Everything else was done with me alone and on my computer. And if I was lucky enough, I would get feedback of how much they love their images. Very often to create content to maybe write a book or create art or music, whatever it is, is done mostly alone. And then once ready to be birthed into the world, that's where the opportunities to connect with others lives. So the only way I know how to keep going forward when I'm not sure anyone's listening is to answer the question, why? Why does it matter? Does it even matter? And this weekend, as that question has been swirling around in my head for a few weeks now, I got my answer. I had an adventure day, those are my favorite days, with my 12-year-old niece, and I told her we could go anywhere she wanted to and do anything she wanted. So we set off on our day, starting with Panera for lunch, then we went to Ulta Beauty, TJ Maxx, Barnes & Noble, and then for the finale, off to our favorite crystal shop. And you want to know what the best part of the day was? The car rides to all of these places. Yes, the car ride. Because we talked about her upcoming role in Shrek, that she once again got into the high school musical as a middle schooler. And we talked about friends and relationships and the future, what she dreams of. We talked about it all. And at one point, she told me how she was feeling about a particular situation. And I asked her, well... Have you told the other person how you feel? And she said, no, no, we don't do that. She said, I don't even know how to express myself. Even though she'd just done it so beautifully with me, it was easy because I wasn't the person she needed to tell her feelings to. To be able to be honest about how we're feeling with someone we care about is one of the most vulnerable and courageous things we can do. So yes. This work matters because our children, the next generation, still struggle to express their feelings just like we do, just like our parents did and our grandparents did. So yes, it matters. We need to learn how to better understand and identify what it is we are feeling so we can more easily express what it is we are feeling with the people we love. Most of us still haven't mastered this. So I'm going to keep going. I'm committing myself to doing this podcast for one year to see what kind of shifts it can bring. And I'm asking you, if this podcast has meant something to you, that you tell me, send me a DM, email, text, or preferably by an owl named Hedwig. And share it. If it has helped you in any way, share it. Share it with your friends, with your people. And if there's anything you want to know more about or a guest you want me to have on, send me that too, because this podcast is for you. It's for me. It's for all of us. And the last piece I want to share came to me this morning on my morning hike with Bazi, which is all about connection. I want to create more opportunities for connection and ultimately the integration of this work. 
Having the knowledge and the language of emotions will only get us so far. What we need to do next is to make it a part of our daily lives. So in the next couple months, I'm going to be sharing ways of how we can learn to more fully integrate this work and how we can all learn to be brave enough to talk about our feelings so we can truly heal. And that's what led me to my morning hike inspiration. It was this idea for my next retreat. And I'm going to call it, you guys are hearing it first, the Brave Enough Retreat. So stay tuned as I start to create that. And if you want to dive deeper into the understanding of the language of emotions, I'm going to be starting another Atlas of the Heart book study in February. Lots to come. All right, let's get started on this week's emotion, resentment. Some of these emotions should come with a warning label, and this is one of them. In preparing for this episode, I've experienced many, many opportunities to feel, see, and better understand resentment. And I'm just praying that when I begin working on the joy episode that I experience an abundance of joy. All right, so resentment. No one wants to be labeled or seen as being resentful. Most of us assume that resentment is a part of the anger family, but it's not. It's actually a part of the envy family, which is how it ended up in this chapter of Atlas of the Heart. This chapter, chapter two, is the places we go when we compare, and it includes comparison, admiration, reverence, envy, jealousy, and now resentment. Perfect example was when I was with my niece this weekend, and she was telling me about her play practices for the upcoming musical Shrek. And she was talking about a couple of her castmates that keep skipping out on play practice for other commitments like sports practice or other things. And it's making her so mad. It's making her resentful. She's resentful towards those who are not working as hard as she is and those who haven't made the sacrifices like she has. She quit everything else just so she could focus on this play. How many times have you felt resentment towards someone else not working as hard as you, not putting in the effort? Maybe you come home and your partner's relaxing on the couch and you come in with a list of a million things that you need to do and you can just feel the resentment oozing out of you and they're just laying there, relaxing. And all of this resentment, it's actually about envy. It's actually about what you are not giving to yourself that you see in someone else. Here's some examples from Atlas of the Heart. I'm not mad because you're resting. I'm mad because I'm so bone tired and I want to rest. But unlike you, I'm going to pretend I don't need to. I'm not furious that you're okay with something that is really good and imperfect. I'm furious because I want to be okay with something that's really good and imperfect. I'm working 60 hours a week. Why aren't you? The resentful feeling is because they are taking the weekend off and you aren't giving that to yourself. I thought you were going to clean the kitchen. Oh, you did? but you didn't clean the counters and empty the sink drain? Is this really clean or just your version of clean? Your resentment is not because the kitchen is perfectly cleaned. It's because why can't I be happy in my house if everything is not perfect? Brene says, there's a knife up against my throat, but I'm the one holding it. Sheesh. And this last one, your lack of work is not making me resentful. My lack of rest is making me resentful. This one really gets me. Your lack of work is not making me resentful. My lack of rest is making me resentful. This is all about envy. I'm envious that you are giving yourself rest when I so clearly need rest and I am not allowing myself to have it. Can you see how this is becoming envy? Here's the definition from Atlas of the Heart. Resentment is the feeling of frustration, judgment, anger, better than, and or hidden envy related to perceived unfairness or injustice. It's an emotion that we often experience when we fail to set boundaries or ask for what we need or when expectations let us down because they were based on things we can't control, like what other people think, what they feel, or how they're going to react. I tried to find a movie or a TV series clip that was as good as the one Brene introduced us to in her HBO special, and I couldn't find a better one. So I'm going to share hers. 
It was a holiday movie from the 90s with that family dynamic of the one sibling who stayed behind to take care of the ailing parents, which is just a breeding ground for resentment. The movie is Home for the Holidays. It's a funny, smart movie directed by Jodie Foster about adult children gathering at their parents' house on Thanksgiving Day. Two siblings, played by Holly Hunter and Robert Downey Jr., are unconventional free spirits who have both moved away and maintained a close relationship. Then there's the other sister, played brilliantly by Cynthia Stevenson, who never left, who takes care of the parents more than they'd like, who's paralyzed by perfectionism and whose rigidity makes her the brunt of family jokes. She's bitter and resentful and exhausted. This is after Thanksgiving dinner. After the dinner goes very wrong and a turkey ends up in the perfect sister's lap, she and her obnoxiously uptight family leave. Then there's a scene when Cynthia Stevenson's character is in the basement of her house working out on her Stairmaster, and Holly Hunter's character comes over to apologize for Thanksgiving turning into a circus. The resentful sister goes off about she's the only one who grew up and how the other two shirked all their responsibilities and now she has to bear it all alone. After she says something really cruel to Holly Hunter's character, she looks down at her Stairmaster and signals for her sister to leave. She says, do you mind? This is the only thing I do all day that I like. Ugh, oozing so much resentment. And I saw this being played out in my family when my grandma was transitioning at the end of her life, and now I'm seeing it play out in Ian's family. There seems to always be that one sibling who does more than the rest and is fueled by resentment. All right, let's talk about resentment and boundaries. There's those times when we fail to set a boundary. There is resentment there. When I've not communicated a boundary that I have, and you, of course, unknowingly stepped over because I've never communicated it to you. And very often, resentment is going on in my head, and the other person doesn't even have a clue. Nelson Mandela famously said, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. And so one of the best ways that I've found about boundaries and re this relationship with resentment is to choose discomfort over resentment. And this is from Brene. I learned it years ago. I'm not sure which one of her books talked about it, but choosing discomfort over resentment. It's been one of the most helpful and uncomfortable lessons I've had to learn over and over again. So when someone asks me to do something, I now pause before saying yes to anything because I've gotten myself into far too many situations that I've said yes to, only to be met with resentment or having to disappoint someone after agreeing to something I never should have in the first place. So when someone asks me to do something that I now know is a no for me, I now choose that one minute of discomfort rather than weeks or months of resentment leading up to doing the thing I don't want to do. This gets easier with practice, the saying no part, the creating boundaries. And if it's something you would like to be asked to do in the future, say that too. Say that to them. I can't volunteer this month, but I'd love to be asked again in the future. Resentment and money. So one of my biggest moments of resentment has to do with money, which is a place that I see resentment come up a lot for a lot of people. I grew up in a family where everything to do with money was fair and even. So if my grandma slipped me a 20, you can be sure she was going to give my sister a 20 the next time she saw her. If my mom helped me out with something, she would then be sure to help my sister out. I've never been worried about things being even because they always were. And when I married my husband, I started to see that not all families operated this way. I would witness his siblings receiving money and never us because it always seemed like we were doing okay. Their distribution of money was based on a perceived need rather than equal fairness. So when we started investing a lot of money into fertility treatments, resentment started to creep up inside of me. My mom on numerous occasions helped us out, knowing how badly we wanted this and how expensive it was getting. And his parents didn't help us. And my husband never asked for help. So I was put in a place that let my resentment grow and grow because as much as I wanted to ask them for help, I didn't want to go behind his back. So you know what I did? Ugh. I made little comments here and there, like 
mentioning how much it was costing and how we couldn't do it again until we saved up or even mentioning that my mom had helped us and nothing changed except my resentment grew. And this resentment wasn't even affecting them, but it was totally affecting me. I found myself not wanting to be around them because of my resentment. And this went on for a while until I read this book and finally understood that my resentment was coming from envy. Yes, I was envious that they had helped his other siblings out and not us and the unfairness, the unjustness of it. But beyond that, the thing that finally set me free was by asking the question, what do I need but I'm afraid to ask for? I never actually asked them and still haven't asked them what I, what we needed. And that might have changed the whole story. But I also recognized that I was resentful because I could not give myself the money that we needed at that time. I actually don't want to need financial help from either of our parents. What I really want is to be able to give that to myself. And I'll be honest, I'm still a work in progress when it comes to resentment. This is still something I'm working on. But I can now see it and better understand what it is I'm feeling. On Kelly Clarkson's show, she recently had Michelle Obama promoting her new book. And they had a great example of how resentment can be overcome when we figure out what it is we need and find a way to give that to ourselves. So they were talking about having children and wanting it to be a 50-50 shared responsibility with your partner and how rarely that's the case. And Michelle said, make sure that you are taking care of yourself because that's the thing we do. Sometimes we take on more because we feel guilty when we go work out or when we go to the hairdresser. She went on to say, my advice when I stopped resenting my husband for that was when I started prioritizing myself and I didn't wait for him. So the help I learned didn't have to come from him, but I needed help. So I relied on my mom, my girlfriends, and a broader community of people to give me that break so I'm not mad at him all the time. Melody Beattie shared that resentments are blocks that hold us back from loving ourselves and others. Resentments do not punish the other person. They punish us. They become barriers to feeling good and enjoying life. They prevent us from being in harmony with the world. Resentments are hardened chunks of anger. They loosen up and dissolve with forgiveness and letting go. Letting go of resentments does not mean we allow the other person to do anything to us that he or she wants. It means we accept what happened in the past and we set boundaries for the future. We can let go of resentments and still have boundaries. We try to see the good in the person or the good that ultimately evolved from whatever incidents we feel resentful about. Then we put the incident to rest. Praying for those we resent, asking God to take our resentment from us helps us too. What a better way to begin a new year than by cleaning the slate of the past and entering this one free of resentments. Pima Chodron, a Buddhist nun, shared an exercise that could help you transcend resentment. It's called Just Like Me, and it's included in her book, Comfortable with Uncertainty, 108 Teachings on Cultivating Fearlessness and Compassion. According to Pima, the Just Like Me exercise can be practiced anytime you feel frustrated or resentful, whether you're stuck in traffic or sitting in a frustrating meeting. When these negative feelings start to bubble up, focus on the people or person triggering these feelings and tell yourself they are just like me. Just like me, that person wants to be loved. Just like me, that person wants to be seen. Just like me, that person wants to be valued. Just like me, that person wants to be heard. So instead of sitting at your desk fuming and stewing in irritation, you can choose to see the other person's humanity. They truly are just like you. They feel the same emotions and have the same fears and want the same things. By being intentional in how you view the person who's frustrating you, you can change the entire vibe of the situation and therefore the rest of your day. Now you have a choice. You can let a poor interaction with your boss first thing in the morning destroy your mood for the rest of the day, or you can be intentional in how you view them, letting you function at a higher vibration and improving your mood. Which do you choose? And here's two of my favorite quotes from Pima Chodron. She said, The way I regard those who hurt me today will affect how I experience the world in the future. In any encounter, we have a choice. 
We can strengthen our resentment or our understanding and empathy. We can widen the gap between ourselves and others or lessen it. And she also said, the greatest obstacle to connecting with our joy is resentment. And Neil Strauss on Instagram said, resentment does to a relationship what corrosion does to a car engine. Eventually, it leads to a breakdown. He went on to share three tips for avoiding resentment in a relationship. The first is communicating your truth with appropriate boundaries. The second is don't try to change your partner. Accept them as they are or choose to leave. And the third is don't agree to do or not do something that isn't true to you just to please your partner. He said suppressing your thoughts and feelings in a relationship leads to resentment. Expressing them without boundaries leads to being resented or worse. And expressing them without blaming, defending, judging, demanding, violating boundaries, or expecting a certain response can lead to growth. So what is it we need to do when we first start to feel the resentment creeping up? This is from Brene's work in Atlas of the Heart. She said, instead of thinking, what is that person doing wrong or what should they be doing? So your partner's laying on the couch, you have a million things, you've got all the groceries, you're unloading the car. So you walk in, instead of thinking, what are they doing wrong or what should they be doing? Think to yourself, what do I need but am afraid to ask for? And if you want to go even further, notice what mean and critical things you are thinking or rehearsing in your mind to say to them. This is always an indicator of resentment. And here's some journal prompts. I'll include them in the show notes for when you're feeling resentful. What or who is triggering this feeling of resentment inside of me? What do I need but am afraid to ask for? Have I shared my true feelings to the person who needs to hear it? Why or why not? Is there a need I can meet for myself? Is there a boundary I need to set? How can I move this energy through my body? And I'd like to leave you today with a reading from Heart Talk by Cleo Wade. She said, with every new day and even every new minute, we have the opportunity to reset our attitude and change our perspective. There will always be people and circumstances that trigger our anger, sadness, or resentment. But when we allow those emotions to stay on a loop in our minds, that is on us, not on them. Instead, if we let go and allow the new day to bring new energy, we are given a clean slate to really understand what is upsetting us and problem solve from a place of freshness rather than a place of hostility. When we have a better attitude, we create better solutions and we have a better life. I'm so grateful you're here. Thank you for listening. And if you loved this episode, will you please share it with a friend or two? Be sure to rate, review, and follow the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts so you're sure to never miss a single episode. This podcast is part of the Sound Advice FM network. Sound Advice FM, women's voices amplified.